Thank you very much for, uh, I'm very honored to come and have a, try and have a chat with you today. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to make patients better and we want to provide a better quality of service for the individuals that we look after. This process involves setting standards for quality, measuring ourselves against those standards, and then in, in, putting in interventions that will then drive up quality over time. And I think also if we're thinking today about where we're going, it's also useful to reflect on where we've been. And this document that uh, Alan Lobo and Simon Travis with Dr. Carter wrote back in 2004 was the very first national document on inflammatory bowel disease. And so we started almost getting on for 10 years ago at a very low level with almost no information. Guidelines have progressed, become more complicated, and produced on a national basis, but these don't tell you about the quality of service that you deliver. And this is where the IBD standards come in. And this has been a seminal document that was initially published after the second round of the audit and very recently updated. Again, if you think back to the start, we weren't, um, I sort of choose my words carefully enough, uh, sort of important enough to, be, to have a national service framework and documents like this have developed into quality standards, and we are fortunate enough to be the subject of a quality standard very recently. But I think many would worry that this may not have the teeth to deliver real service improvements, certainly in its draft form that we saw earlier in the year. So this is where the audit comes in. And as all of you will know here, this is a multidisciplinary collaborative project that originated with patients the British Society of Gastroenterology, the coloproctologists, and the paediatricians. And I think this slide gives you good, uh, is a good illustration of how the project has expanded over the years. And uh, when we started first in 2006, there was just clinical and organizational data. And as you can see, we have expanded to include paediatricians, primary care, and subsequently biologics. Have we engaged the clinical community? And I show this slide, and I'll show this in the next few were from, my, uh, from the presentation yesterday, which shows certainly at a trust and health board level, we have managed to engage almost all of the clinical community. And this, I, I, I would freely uh, admit, involves a series of both carrots and sticks. But I think the, the figure at the bottom of collecting data on 4,59 patients with ulcerative colitis over a year is no mean feat and should, should not be underestimated. So have we made a difference? And I think this is the sort of key question if you're looking forward. Look back, see if you've done any good. And certainly uh, if you look at some of the um, outputs from the audit, you will see substantial changes. There's been a real difference in the availability of um, I, specialist IBD nurses, although I would agree that many haven't achieved the levels as set out in the standards. And there have been marked changes in the provision of services, and simple aspects of your service are documented here. What about inpatient care? And again, as I showed yesterday, there have been sustained and ongoing improvements that have persisted beyond when many people might think that the curve may flatten off. And I think it's very encouraging to see low mortality and you know, very high levels of, of, of basic care, such as the prescription of, of heparin or bone protection. And again, data such as the audit and, and arguably the registry can produce this sort of data where you can see the outcomes of very many people with ulcerative colitis that would be difficult to gain, difficult to, to, to gain from other sources. As with all of these projects, we have highlighted a number of areas of real concern. And I think, as I mentioned yesterday, 11% of people who are admitted with ulcerative colitis are on no treatment. And there is, and I think this slide raises really important questions about what we do with people when we see them in clinic. And if you've got active disease, if you're not changing treatment in up to half of people, then I think you, you do have to ask questions. 
and again, steroid sparing therapies in 22%. And I think the point that I would like to make is that although we have seen benefits, there is still a lot of work to do. Again, similarly with anemia, we all know anemia is common, but I think the most important figure is that one at the bottom, where if you've got iron deficiency anemia, half of people didn't receive any treatment. And this is not, um, for want of a better expression, rocket science. The inpatient experience uh, questionnaire, which was uh, much more successful this time than the last time, again showed very um, obvious uh, differences between certain groups of people. And this marked disparity between, the ad between adolescents looked after in pediatric and adult services, again has a reflection for how we organize our services within any geographical area. And again, an illustration of how patient experience can change, albeit in a minor way over between rounds. I would be the first to agree that there are a number of challenges associated with, with ongoing data collection. And I think the <coughs> burden that we have imposed on, on, on clinicians right across the country is not to be uh, di dismissed. There is undoubtedly a, a process of audit fatigue. And I think there is also a question about how you best support people to change their service. There's no point in just collecting the data unless you're going to do something with it. I think we definitely need to be aware of sources of bias, and you, you could argue, well, are the changes you've seen just because people are selecting their cases differently? And there may be a series of improvements, and I think we have to continue to evolve and be clinically re relevant and do things that are use useful to people. So what will happen in the future? So HQIP funding for the current round of, of, of IBD audit is, is, is secure until February of 2015. And over this next 18 months, we're going to try and have a focus on quality improvement, try and enable people to make the best use of their data. We'll try and do this through a series of regional meetings. We're going to publish a patient-specific report. And there will be national action plans that tries to make sense of the different data streams. There will then be a retendering process, I hope. And I think this is the key time for what we've come today. And I think there's a real opportunity here for us to use this to get together under one umbrella, and integrate, modernize, simplify, and produce something that is even better and even more meaningful for clinicians out there. So I would therefore say that audit continues to drive quality improvement, but I think I've shown you evidence today that there is still much to be done, and I don't think it's ready for the dustbin <coughs> quite yet. I think there are really significant opportunities to collaborate, come together, and that has to be the logical future. HQIP funding brings its challenges, shall we say. But I think with those challenges, it also brings significant opportunities, and we should embrace this if we uh, 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 possibly can at all. I think in this role, there is a key role for the registry as being the, the, the method for data collection. And I, uh, and I think, you know, quite apart from the funding, there will be a number of barriers within the clinical community to get us all together, to bang our heads together, to get us all round one table. But I am absolutely sure that in the long term, this will b bring benefits for clinicians, but most importantly, for patients. And again, I make no apologies for showing this uh, slide again, but particularly to thank the people in the audience who selflessly, week after week, enter data into the UK IBD audit. And I must pass on my most sincere thanks. Thank you.